Support for Living and Learning with Disabilities comes from Living Innovations, providing support for people with developmental disabilities to have a good life at home and in the community. Services include community connections, which facilitates employment, skill development, and community integration to maximize each individual's well-being and independence. For more information or to learn about job opportunities for compassionate people wishing to do meaningful work, visit livinginnovations.com. And by the Natural Care Wellness Center, which has been serving the New Hampshire and Maine Seacoast for 22 years. Our goal is to encourage a healthy lifestyle through education, wellness choices, and hands-on healing. Natural Care Wellness Center offers gentle force chiropractic, family and child wellness, chiropractic acupuncture, holistic nutrition, nutrition response testing, a decompression table, therapeutic exercise, whole food supplements, neuroemotional techniques, and massage therapy. Welcome to Chloe's Shred Shed. I started this small business because I love shredding. I am proud to provide a valuable service in my local community. Being an entrepreneur made it possible for me to keep working during the pandemic. I like working and having a purpose. Sometimes we miss all those wonderful qualities that we just listed in that last song. Because we decide who people are before we even get to know them. Based on maybe what they look like, how they talk, what kind of clothes they're wearing, what kind of music they like, whatever. We decide who they are before we ever get to know who they really are inside. And it happens to us too. Sometimes people decide who we are before they know us. I think all we really want is just for, for people to see us for who we really are. Look for the best in me It's what I really am And all I want to be It may take some time It may be hard to find But see me beautiful See me beautiful Each and every day Could you take a chance Could you find a way To see me shining through in everything I do and see me beautiful see me beautiful Look for the best in me It's what I really am And all I want to be It may take some time It may be hard to find But see me beautiful See me beautiful Each and every day Could you take a chance Could you find a way To see me shining through in everything I do and see me
Allison Decker. I'm sorry, I was just going to say that was a nice way to start a show. Yeah, great to see everybody. Good I'm going to um, act, radiantly acquiesce to my great friend Wendy Chase here, who's going to do an uh, interview today, take the lead, and we'll all jump in for talking with Leah and Lisa, but you're the, gonna be the main one, my friend. <laughs> Just, we can't hear. No, you can't hear me. We can now. Oh, very good. Oh, very good. all right, yeah. because now I have a new device. <laughs> so you can, good, okay. I would like very, very much to thank my guests today, our guests today, my good friend Lisa Bodron and Leah Stage Stage Joan. Am I saying it right? Stagnone. Thank you. From Abel, New Hampshire. I've known Lisa for quite a few years now. We've worked together on things. She's a great mentor for me. Um, I just rely on uh, her incredible knowledge of the disability community. And I have just learned so very much. I hope that we will remain friends and colleagues for many, many years. So Lisa is the, um, the director of ABLE New Hampshire, and I'm going to just pass it over. Lisa, you want to explain a little bit about that to people, and then we'll have Leah the same. Sure. Great. Thank you so much. And again, thanks. Uh, thanks to Living and Learning with Disabilities for inviting us on today. It's a real privilege to be here, so thank you. And um, Wendy, I share the same sentiment with you. Um, I'm so glad we can work together and, and know it'll, it'll be a lifetime. So uh, ABLE New Hampshire, ABLE is an acronym. It stands for Advocates Building Lasting Equality. We are the Granite State's only disability justice organization completely free of public funds. And that means we take no uh, Medicaid dollars and no tax raised money. And we do that because ABLE New Hampshire has one little tool that most other disability organizations don't have. And we don't fear financial reprisal when, when in those occasions it is necessary to tell hard truths and have courageous conversations. ABLE can do that when other organizations might fear financial retaliation. So um, ABLE New Hampshire's mission is to advance civil and human rights for people with disabilities and we promote full participation. Um, our mission statement says we do that by influencing public policy, organizing um, families, inspiring communities, and um, yeah, so ABLE organizes ordinary citizens to become extraordinary leaders. And we really push for um, people in their own communities, whether it's their town, their elected uh, house, New Hampshire house district, or whether it's the, the whole state. We um, encourage people to organize for the change that they seek. And in, and in an ideal way, ABLE provides communities, individuals, leaders with the tools they need using community organizing principles to create the systems change to really have an impact on, on moving the needle for dignity and inclusion for people with disabilities in, in our everyday lives. Thank you so much. You can see Leah and I are, yep, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I am um, actually on the seacoast so I, I do chime in once in a while with the Seacoast ABLE chapter. A good friend of mine who I hope that we have on the show sometime, Alex has just been doing some tremendous work in, in the, um, his hometown of Dover, which is next door to me. So it's, um, I just try to do as much as I can to help my local ABLE and also working with Lisa to do things is definitely at the, um, the legislative part and keeping in touch with things and um, just being able to, to help and to support legislation that comes through that I feel very strongly about. And that can even be, you know, by testifying or just at least putting in my support as I just did for the dental bill again. And I did testify for that last time. So we all work together really well. I encourage others who are watching today, if you have 
to want to find out more about ABLE, please look on the website that we're going to provide for you or just look up ABLE New Hampshire and get involved. There's a great group of people and you really will find, find your spot and find your courage. That's it for me. So Leah, tell us a little bit about what you do. Sure. Um, I've worked for ABLE New Hampshire for the last um, year and a half or so as a community organizer. Um, so what my job um, involves is I work with our regional chapters, um, do a lot of work with our membership. I um, work with our voter engagement task force. So um, pretty much every day I get to um, right now on Zoom see um, the faces of our wonderful members and um, work with them. And um, as Lisa mentioned, we at ABLE New Hampshire um, organize ordinary citizens to become extraordinary leaders. And um, that's one of my favorite parts of my job um, has been to, as my own leadership grows, um, to also see um, our own membership become empowered and to help them develop the tools that they need to lift up their own stories and the issues that they care about. Um, so that's what I spend um, a lot of my time doing. So why don't you to share some of the um, topics? We've got a lot of them that are very important and there are so many more, but the ones that are really, really pressing right now are on your minds. What can the community do to be aware? So there are in the, in the, in the very near term, oh, let me just add a little something about ABLE. Um, in order for disability justice to become a reality, um, people with and without disabilities really need to participate in, in moving the needle um, on a, a robust community-based life for people with disabilities. So um, ABLE is not an exclusive organization simply for, for people with disabilities and their families. It's in fact, we need allies who are not yet impacted by disability because most people are either a birth, a decade, or an accident away from being in the disability community. So this touches everyone. Um, the two most, two or three, there are two or three pressing legislative things happening right now. One is that um, oral health care for Medicaid recipients is up for being approved and getting funded. It's a budget year. And the program design for Medicaid oral health um, is has been long um, underway. That program is is just about built. It needs to be funded, and we need the legislature this year. So, if you'd like to get involved with making sure that not just people with disabilities on Medicaid, but all vulnerable populations have access to appropriate oral health care, um, contact Able because it's going to be um, a pretty heavy lift ensuring that we get a yes vote to fund Medicaid oral health. Um, the other big deal is that uh, adults with disabilities, uh, with significant developmental, or I'm, I'm sorry, with developmental disabilities are on something known as the Developmental Disability Waiver. It's a Medicaid program and every two years at budget time, the legislature has a number in the budget put in front of them that is what it takes to fully fund adult services for people with disabilities, again, to have a robust community-based life. And um, the, the budget is, the budget for adults with disabilities is always, um, it's treated as a political football, so to speak. Uh, and sometimes adult services are fully funded and sometimes they are not. And so it would be really fantastic to have um, people get involved with letting our elected officials know um, vote yes to fully fund adult services for people with disabilities who are on the, the DD waiver. So those are, those are two really hot button issues that are very alive for ABLE, um, the membership and, and more broadly people with disabilities across New Hampshire. Leah, do you wanna add? Um, I think that you covered it pretty well. Uh, I just wanna underscore, I guess, how important um, funding for those those issues is, is to our community in New Hampshire. Um, it's what um, that full funding of adult services is what allows um, 
many folks with disabilities in New Hampshire to live lives and their to live community-based lives, um, which is their right. Um, and the um, or Medicaid oral health is something that you know we hear stories about um, all the time. Um, there are so many, and I know Lisa, you have the numbers on that. I'm not thinking of them off the top of my head, um, but it's something we hear stories about constantly. Um, people who haven't been able to access um, dental care. Um, so um, they're really big issues that impact the disability community in New Hampshire. And I, I'll just piggyback, thanks Leah. Um, if we don't fully fund adult services for people with disabilities or oral health, um, we're being penny wise and pound foolish, right? Because you can't separate the head from the body. Oral health care is part of overall, overall health care. So if you don't get someone a, a dental cleaning or to, to clean up a minor uh, tooth decay with, with a small filling, you end up with someone who's in the emergency room who needs to have an extraction, maybe has an infection. Maybe it's the beginning of them having um, other larger healthcare issues like heart disease or diabetes. These things are all connected. Um, and Medicaid currently covers emergency services which are far more expensive than a $120 annual dental cleaning. So um, when people with disabilities are in the community and get the support they need, they often have um, jobs, which means they need fewer Medicaid dollars, right? They're volunteering, so they're contributing to the economy. They are, you know, this is an important, um, it's important to realize that it's, it's fiscally smart to support um, people with disabilities to have their place in America. So, I would just like to add that, I mean, the, the worst pain I can ever remember, and they may be true for others in your life, is, is uh, pain from a, from a bad tooth. I mean, that, that's just pain on, a, on another level. I, I, I mean, I, I would think that everybody could relate to that. Yeah. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Oh. Mouth is really the center of everything. I know your heart makes you work, but your mouth, I was it, I went to um, dental school in my other life. I went, I'm not a dentist, I was an assistant and did um, some hygiene. But we did learn that, that each tooth represents parts of the body. So it's just absolutely amazing. And it always blew my mind. And for, you know, with my daughter, which you, you all know, the story, poor Erin, because of her medications, um, her teeth just rotted. They were falling out and she, I mean, oh, she had a beautiful mouth of teeth in the beginning and um, it started out with the chemotherapy, not letting the, her primary teeth develop properly. So she had to have a lot of distractions and, and then she had braces and then uh, down the line, as she changed her medications, which she was on opiates and, and other um, pain medications, it just did a number. And the poor kid was always in pain, but didn't have any dental insurance. I mean, we would take her in and, and do what we could, but it just was a mess. And in, um, I've seen it, you know, I've seen it firsthand. And I know, and I was such an advocate to my children to brush, 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 and I know the background. So it's just so extremely important. And I wish that the legislation, when we're looking at this, we're looking at the budget, people realize that your mouth really controls so much of your body. And as you're saying, pre-existing conditions or upcoming conditions and to stick a Band-Aid on that by just going in and having an extraction, putting someone on pain medications, not the way to do it. Sorry, uh, John. When, yeah, I will, I will uh, chime in on that one. Uh, I had a artificial uh, aortic valve put in uh, two years ago and I have to have cleanings three times a year. Uh, mm -hmm. from Lady Clinic in, in Burlington, the cardiologist insisted on it. He said the connection between heart disease and uh, oral health is absolutely known. And um, the insur I have insurance that pays for it, but uh, he said exactly what, what you said, Lisa. He said it's much cheaper to take care of that. He said, because if you get an infection in that valve, you get endocarditis and you can die from that. So um, 
Yeah, so I've really heard that. And I want to also mention this. I don't know if you want to show it or not, but I do have that video that's online from Abel. Uh, it's loaded. And if you at, at any one point in the show want to show it, just let me know and I can share it. Just wanted to mention that. If Thanks. not, that's okay too. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, there's another legislative um, hot topic that just, um, I can't believe I didn't, I didn't mention it earlier. It's, um, and it's up this week, the week of February 1st, um, its first hearing is happening, it's HB 20. And it's the bill that's proposing um, funding to create vouchers so that students can um, have money to leave their local public schools. And um, Abel and, and uh, me, I am, I am very empathetic that a number of families who go through the IEP process have a bear of a time getting the appropriate services that they need. Um, and I understand that there's a long way to go in terms of students with disabilities having a feeling of belonging and a feeling and, and, and accessing general education and, and everything that they need to be staged for success. I get that. However, um, the solution to students with disabilities um, getting what they need in our public schools is not to give them money to go into a private school um, that may not be able to offer them the appropriate supports and services that are promised to them through IDEA, the federal law that creates special education. So that's like, cause that's giving an out to the public schools that don't currently have inclusive school culture and they don't have a feeling of belonging. That's, we don't wanna give public schools a pass, but worse, if we allow students with and without disabilities to take public dollars to the private system, students with disabilities who are left behind are the ones most hurt by the voucher system. Um, and we will drain our public schools of what they need to provide uh, a truly equitable education for all students, whether it's English language learners, affluent students, um, you know, students who have no troubles with school whatsoever, as well as other vulnerable populations. So um, Abel New Hampshire and the vast majority of its membership are staunchly in opposition to the voucher bill because the long-term negative consequences of allowing public monies to go into private schools is far more detrimental to the disability community than the short-term fix to the frustration that families feel when their kids are marginalized and when families are bullied by special ed departments. Like ABLE exists, the DRC exists, other disability organizations exist so that we can really force people, force school buildings and school districts to do the right thing and to create inclusive school culture and to have strong family um, school partnerships for special ed families. Um, we can't, you know, that, that work should not be abandoned with this sort of seemingly magical instant fix of take your money and run. Um, it's, so I'm, I'll get off my soapbox, um, but uh, clearly this is a passionate issue um, with lots of points of view, but it's critically important that we stay focused on the prize that public education is, is the way in which um, all Americans can build the, the American dream for themselves. Lisa, did you say you work with Stephanie Patrick at DRC? Did you? Great lady, she was on the show. Oh yeah, she is fantastic. Oh, yeah. She comes every year. <laughs> well, I hope Abel can come every year. Yeah, sure, sure. Talk a little bit about the community-based housing where we're, I'm actually in session right now and we've got landlord tenant um, bills we're listening today. Not that that has to do with it, but housing is such an important issue right now, especially in COVID. Tell me a little about what's going on. Sure. So um, the fingers crossed our work with oral health care is about to be over. And we've known, Abel has known, the board of directors has known for quite some time that we would have to get really focused on housing. And so as everyone listening and, and all of you know, um, workforce housing, affordable housing, accessible housing 
is in incredibly short supply, um, uh, that this that the legislature and communities around New Hampshire have not aggressively addressed the lack of affordable housing is is kind of um, it's kind of puzzling, you know, to stay to be polite and to put it mildly, it's kind of puzzling. Um, so in the second half of 2021, Abel is going to be getting involved with um, really pressing for the creation of policies and regulations that expand affordable, accessible housing um, for people with disabilities in particular, but we're gonna also be playing our part um, to make sure that all vulnerable citizens in the Granite State actually um, have an opportunity to, to get adequate housing. And um, in the disability community, if we do not have adequate housing for adults with disabilities who require lots of supports, Families get panicked, especially pa parents approaching um, elder status, mm -hmm. senior citizens with adults with who need significant supports. If they can't have a solid plan and a solid place as they are aging, um, justifiably people become terribly frightened and and the mind wanders off to this old paradigm called segregated housing, whether it's a mini institution, whether it's a big institution, whether it's a group home, whatever it may be, that model is a segregated model. And that model we know from existing housing, where, which is, you know, existing segregated housing all across America still exists. There are still institutions. There are still large group homes. There are still small group homes. Those kinds of settings work against justice for people with disability. But more importantly, those are the kinds of isolated places where abuse and neglect is rampant. New Hampshire's lucky. We don't have a state institution. But there isn't a quarter that goes by where I don't see something in the news media where people in a segregated housing setting have been abused or neglected um, or been financially exploited by their caretakers. And so um, we, we need to come together as a community because we cannot fall back to the days of Laconia State School which by the way, just celebrated its 30th anniversary of the closing. Nice. Um, January 30th was uh, the closing, was the, um, was the 30th, marked the 30th anniversary. And that's um, a, a great achievement. New Hampshire uh, was the first state to close its state institution. And um, we have to, we can never go back. No. So um, um, accessible dwelling units was passed a couple of years ago in New Hampshire. That was, a really great um, option that um, supports families with disabilities and others, um, other um, moderate income and low income families to have options in their homes. Um, and we just need to keep making headway and we need to rigorously and ferociously demand more affordable, accessible housing. You know that it's even what I'm reading in the newspapers and seeing on television is that because of the pandemic, people are getting fleeing these high population states like New Jersey and New York and coming up to Maine and New Hampshire where they believe that they will be safer uh, without you know, always being in a crowd and stuff like that. So it's, that's making it worse, I would believe even more than normally. Well, it's it's artificially inflated housing prices, and it's it's upset our um, mm -hmm. stability of our market in terms of being afford. Like if if you live in New New York, New Jersey, Miami, even Austin, we there was there was a family from Austin, Texas, that bought a property not too far from my home, um, sight unseen. They bought it. Mm -hmm. That's how that's how desperately they wanted to get out of Texas. Um, but when you have people who earn significantly more because their their home of origin has a has higher rates of pay because of local because of local costs, um, it's it's also adversely impacted the affordability of both rentals as well as first time home buying in New Hampshire. Um, it's 
it's a bummer that that is a really ugly consequence to COVID-19. Having uh, Lori McIntosh on from our place in a couple of weeks and Doug will be with her and I'm, I'm just curious how she's doing with her little new adventure and getting housing. Um, what else? If, when you do sit, get the chance to start working on the affordable, please let me know. I'd like to do whatever I can. I'm on a, a you know, co-signed couple of bills right now for affordable housing, but the bigger the push and the more we get going with that, I absolutely 100% back you and will back you. Great. And I just want to encourage um, viewers that if, if housing is important to you, whether it's from the lens of caring about people who are homeless or caring about new Americans, whatever your lens is on homeless, I mean, on, on the housing issue. If you haven't found a home to get involved with housing, come to ABLE because we're, we have to build a team. Um, the staff here at ABLE, um, you know, we're, we just like to support people to move issues. Um, and the housing issue is really a cross, huge cross coalition. And um, we're gonna need folks to sit in on coalition meetings, there are housing coalitions, and that's a very specific way in which um, you can get involved is, is to help out with um, what will be our housing, our housing project. Very exciting. Yes, and I'm writing down my ass. I haven't forgot you. <laughs> well, when we, when we get to this as well. Um, I know when my daughter, when Erin, was looking for housing, the hoops that we had to go through to get her into a, well, at the, it was section eight, uh, a um, disabled apartment was unbelievable. We actually put her into a assisted living facility to prove to the state that it cost more to put her into assisted living than it did for them to give her her voucher. And Looking back on it now, it was a horrible thing to do to a 27 year old and put them in with a lot of elderly people. She saw things she should have never seen, um, but it, it worked. She got top to the list and she moved into a beautiful brand new apartment that was all handicap accessible and she could stay there for and she did. She stayed there until her end of life. Um, but it was a lot and, and it was exhausting. So I really, really do want to do whatever I can to help. Thanks, Wendy, for that story. Um, it's fantastic that you found a solution that worked. Families shouldn't have to do that, but that story, <laughs> yeah, that story is very, very compelling and it it's going to be powerful in the campaign around improving um, access to affordable, accessible housing. Um, so thanks for, thanks for sharing that story. That's, that's an extraordinary. <laughs> it's, it's, it's life lessons and where they can help. You know, that that's why I am, I'm doing what I'm doing. I have to give back. I want to do what I can. Right. You know, the, the, the sad reality is that families do whatever it takes mm -hmm. and it shouldn't have to be that way. It shouldn't have to be that hard. Um, and that's why it's so that's why it's so important for all of us to just work together to to do the systems change. Um, each one of us um, is an instrument in this symphony called disability justice. And um, we all have different parts that we play. We all bring different superpowers and skills and points of view and life experience. And all of that together um, is is really what creates the transformation that we need. So um, Woohoo, Wendy, I've got your number. I know where to find you. <laughs> <laughs> Another hoops and obstacles to get you, but yes, absolutely we'll work with you. Pamela. Yes. What are you thinking? Oh my goodness. I know it's a lot. I love I'm it. right, I'm writing all the notes from Lisa. <laughs> Um, and really looking at it from the perspective of how many people who, who are disabled who have nothing, you know, uh, and you'll find many homeless and you find that, and it's so sad because it, they're, they're, the, they're the best population to work with. Um, 
And I just feel like, you know, this, this is, this is so important, so important for whatever bills to be passed to help them. Um, someone doesn't have any housing, what happens to them? You know, truly. So, so yeah. So that's a really important part of this, as well as the, the oral health. Absolutely, the oral health. Um, yeah. Hey, Leah, yeah. will you talk a little? I'm sorry, I, I think Leah should tell us a little bit about how she's getting people engaged with um, legislators. Sure. Um, so uh, something that we started working on, I guess, back over the summer um, was um, voter engagement up until um, the election. Um, we did some trainings on um, voting rights and so accessible voting and voting safely during COVID-19 for people with disabilities. We had uh, New Hampshire's first, first ever gubernatorial town hall on disability issues, which was great, um, and, and did a lot of voter engagement and um, spreading information about voting for people with disabilities and encouraging people to get out to vote and um, formed a task force around that. Um, and now that the November election is passed, um, we've chosen to um, pivot our focus to the legislature. Um, we've got some really important priorities this year, and um, we've got some really engaged task force members and chapter members who um, want to be a part of that. And so we've been uh, making sure that people are connected with their um, representatives. Uh, we've been doing a lot of one-on-one um, -on -one meetings and, and not just, you know, well, both talking about Able New Hampshire's legislative priorities and why those are so important to our community, but also building um, relationships with those elected officials uh, so that we can um, be a resource to them so that they can call us up um, if they have a question, if they don't understand a disability policy issue and they need some background, or if they have a constituent who is having trouble navigating systems of supports and needs direction to resources. So um, we've been working really hard to uh, build those relationships. Um, it's been a team effort and it's been really great to watch our members uh, grow in their own leadership through that process. I was fortunate enough to be one of the guests for the Seacoast chapter and it was, uh, it was great. It was. I was surprised with the questions and I know that they were just very well written, really well thought out. There's a lot of engagement. I learned a lot. <laughs> so, and it, it's just a wonderful thing that you're doing to be able to get people to realize that, you know, we're all the same and we're, we're approachable and we want to help. That's the reason that we ran to be where we are is to be that voice. So, I greatly appreciate what you're doing and I hope um, that that it continues. I know I gave a couple of other names of people to try to get in touch with and do the one on ones and and it also builds such um, encouragement and um, uh, what's the word, you know, just just feeling self sufficient when a person is able to do that to go and ask look this is my problem. Here's what, what I, I'd like to find out more information about. And it gives you that strength to know that, you know, I have the right to do that. I have the right to ask. I have the right to find out what the questions are. And if it's not what I want to hear, I can take that little food of thought and I can go ask somebody else until I put it together and see what I can do to become a better advocate myself. So, yeah, great work, guys. Of course. Thank you. When, um, Representative Chase, I think you're right. Um, it's very empowering to um, realize that you can play a role in fixing broken systems um, and, and forming those relationships. Um, I, I think for many people with disabilities, whether you're navigating the education system or the healthcare system, um, it can get very discouraging and feel very lonely. And realizing that you have a team behind you, realizing that you have the tools to build those relationships and affect change, um, can it feels really good. So it's been, um, I've really loved working with that, um, with that task force and with 
um, our chapter members as well on doing that um, voter engagement and legislative engagement work. Yeah, and and all of our trainings are open to the public, right? You, um, our membership, um, while it's great if people can pay dues and be a dues paying member, um, really we have a free membership status because we want people to get the tools that it takes to be on the team creating change. And, and we, you know, um, Abel is, Abel's staff and board of directors are super passionate, super engaged people, but really Abel fundamentally is about people moving their values with people who share those values in the public arena to, to create a, a, a warmer, more wonderful world where everybody is included, right? We, we take very seriously all means all. And our trainings and our work is really about making sure that, um, that people have what it takes to to um, bring their bring what they value into the public arena and and to make sure that what what their values are are reflected in in uh, in the communities we live in whether it's sharing them with elected officials or sharing sharing them with the people who are in charge of rehabbing the local playground that might not currently be ADA accessible right so. Mm -hmm. um, we want people to be able to effectively move their values in community and to not feel powerless. I'm, I'm, oh, sorry, John, I was just gonna say this. Well, I, yeah, I was, I was just gonna say, I, I, I taught in the middle and high school for 30, 36 years. And I had uh, seven years during that time at which I, I taught biology and physics and media production. And then I also ran a gifted and talented program for seven years. You're talking about the voucher system. And I just wanna mention this. I had children uh, in middle school in, the voucher, in my uh, gifted and talented program that were not, were, were special needs children because what we found out is that many of them in a regular classroom weren't able to process things and do things as well as other kids, but they had talents that when I had was working one-on-one -on -one with them in the room, uh, like electronics, learning to solder and things like that, learning about circuits and or, or doing media production type things, they just blossomed. And uh, I got, as, as the years went on, I would hear teachers say, that, that child just has, you know, no, no stamina or no interest. And I, oh, yes, they do, if you give them a chance to show it. And mm -hmm. I, I had that program for, like I said, seven years. Then we had the voucher business going for schools. This was in Massachusetts. And they were going for, um, they started taking money out of our budget. They closed the program down. That was one of the first things they did. They closed that program down and I went back to um, the regular classroom. But I just wanted, to, it's, it's also kids who are not maybe disabled, but um, physically disabled, but have, have intellectual disabilities maybe, who uh, get, get cut out of those kind of programs that are designed to help students who don't necessarily have any disabilities. They're all, everybody has something that they can a benefit from in a program like that. And it was taken away from a whole bunch of kids. And I'll tell you to this day, and I've been retired for like 15 years now, to this day, I will still get some emails and on Facebook from some of my students uh, who remember how crazy I was and how much fun they had in class. So <laughs> yeah, um, I, I would just wanna say that <clears throat> it's not only helping people with who actually have the disability, it's, it, it's an enormous benefit to the other kids. And I just remember one, we've had so many shows and then one story I'm just flashing back on is uh, the school where there was no way to get to the second floor classroom except by stairs. And this kid was in a wheelchair. So the other kids took turns carrying him up the stairway. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, so it's, you, you think, oh, you just focused on, this is only gonna benefit the kids with the disability, but it's an enormous benefit to the rest of the kids and the rest of the population. So when you, when you make it a narrow issue, say, no, this is your chance to become more of a human being, you know? 
that this is part of your human family. Yeah, exactly. So disability is a natural part of human diversity, right? Yeah. Um, precisely. And um, Vanderbilt now has, Vanderbilt University now has replicated studies, not just one little random small study, but now they're, they have uh, several studies that indicate that when all students are learning together in an inclusive school situation, um, where there's a feeling of belonging for all students, outcomes for all students go up. It's not just students with disabilities. So we are actually ripping off all students by having segregated learning. Now, is it a heavy lift to transform our current public school system in New Hampshire from a segregated, those kids over there down the hallway system? Sure, it's a heavy lift but we need to move toward inclusive school culture because the data and the research is clear. We have 30 years of research on inclusive education. There is not a single study that says that segregated learning, special education classrooms yields higher outcomes. And now we have research that indicates that inclusive school culture benefits all students. So, mm -hmm. We need to make sure that our land grant universities have teachers that are trained to teach all students. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs to know about this concept of universal des design within a classroom. We need to change the attitudes of school administrators and staff um, across buildings, across school districts that we need, we need to I'm this is like my most serious issue, right? Because if we don't have young Americans leaving high school believing that people with disabilities should be in the middle of our society the way that people with disabilities could be in the middle of our school buildings, right? We're never going to get to actual inclusion for people with disabilities across, uh, you know, in all of our communities. So in our schools, we need to really ferociously hold to account school boards, school administrators, teachers, special, you know, everyone to uh, principals um, to account that we need to be making this transition um, that universal design in education, it works. Um, and it's not only um, good for justice and ethical reasons, it's actually the data says it's the best way to make sure everybody has the best tools to be staged for lifelong learning and success, right? Mm -hmm. um, all means all. Yeah. Sorry, mm -hmm. just got up on my soapbox again. <laughs> beautiful. That's wow. beautiful. Yeah. You're doing well on that soapbox. Don't get off. Yes. When I was in school, we had the classrooms, there was no integration whatsoever except at lunchtime. And that was horrible when I look back at my elementary school, when the all the kids, Mrs. Brown's class, you know, they would get to have lunch and recess with us. And it was just a show of horridness. I hated it, absolutely hated it. Um, same thing in junior high. So, but then when my children, so I'm talking about the 60s, 70s when my kids went to school they were more inclusive um but it was it was still new it was new that was in the, the 90s when erin became so she wasn't able to really walk up the stairs because it wasn't handicap accessible her, her um classmates did carry her a lot too she was tiny but it was fun you know and, and she loved it and um I think she was the first child to go through the school system she was in who was on active chemotherapy. So things have come a really long way and people she's been on to talk about that or had been, they were afraid of her. AIDS was also huge then. So is she contagious? I don't want my child playing with her. She used to have to sit with the teacher and not be able to play on the playground. And I finally, what the heck? They put her on a special bus. They, So I've seen things evolve and I know how much further they need to. I've been out of the education area for a long time, but again, it's things I'm gonna keep fighting for. It's so important. And another person we wanna have on is um, the Habibs because right there, the, 
I'm going to do that. You guys will be blown away with that. And, and that's a really good family to talk about these things. Yeah. You, you know, Wendy, we're never going to let you retire because your leadership in the legislature is too critical, right? You know, you've, you've, you, you're not going to get out of, uh, get out of jail free card. You know? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You've got to know that I banged my head against the wall forever until I found leadership. And I can't, and, and all of you, it's like, well, here's my peeps. Here's the people who understand. Here are the people that I can help. So I truly believe everything you're saying about getting motivation and getting our, not just disability community, our community is going to happen to everybody together to understand we have to work together. We have to find our voices, and I'm not going anywhere, Lisa. <laughs> yeah, you just you just need to get over get over that shyness, there, yeah, Wendy. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. The world has the same problems I do with my child. But behold, there are lots. Do you want to segue into um, the the video of of the support as people? You know which one I'm talking about, Lisa, you guys just did. I think it's a good way of showing how everybody talks about what their needs are to their support person and not to be afraid. Oh, yeah, that would be great. The DSP video, that, please, that would be fabulous. Okay, I hope I got the right one. It's a, let's, let's, <laughs> if I, here we go. Supporting individual choice and a robust community-based life. Messages for direct support professionals. This video was created as part of an interactive training for direct support professionals entitled Dream Big, Tools for Supporting Individual Choice and a Robust Community-Based Life. The training is available at no charge for provider agencies as part of the Living Well NH Quality Frameworks Grant. For details and to schedule training, please contact the NH Council on Developmental Disabilities at info at nhcdd.us. My DSP to help me develop my public speaking skills so that I could testify at state hearings to support people with disabilities. I want my DSP to take terrific notes in my college classes so that I can focus on the lecture. I want my DSP to not feel uncomfortable when she sees me holding my girlfriend's hand. I want my DSP to help me start a rock band. <laughs> I want my DSP to help support me with my dating app so I can find a girlfriend. I want my DSP to take me apartment hunting. I want my DSP to provide some on-the-job support so I can work and explore new opportunities in the grocery and retail industries. In embracing a person-centered approach and supporting self-direction, people receiving supports need to be empowered to make their own choices, whether it involves relationships, privacy, sexuality, well-being, or other areas. People with intellectual and developmental disabilities should be supported in making informed decisions while understanding the associated risks and responsibilities that are tied to those decisions. National Association of Direct Support Professionals. Special thanks to the participants in order of appearance. Devin, Forrest, Alex, Oliver, Samuel, Kelly, Chloe. Presented by New Hampshire Council on Developmental Disabilities, ABLE NH, and People First of NH. The content of this training was developed by the NH Council on Developmental Disabilities in partnership with the Living Well New Hampshire Quality Frameworks Grant, funded from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Administration for Community Living, Administration on Disabilities, Developmental Disabilities Projects of National Significance. The contents do not necessarily represent the policy of the Department of Health and Human Services Administration for Community Living Department, and you should not assume endorsement by the federal government. I love that. And I love those people. <laughs> I know, huh?
Yeah, great video. We, um, Abel is really proud of the work we've been doing on the Living Well Quality Frameworks grant and that training for DSPs is fabulous. It's still free. So viewers, if you want to um, have that training at a local provider agency near to you, please contact us. We are happy to provide a free training for DSPs on, on how to provide a more robust community-based life for the person that you support to have that life. So um, it's great work. Thank you so much for sharing it. I, I hate to tell you, but we're, we're about done. I got, a, I got three minutes I have to play for the outro. So Wendy, I'll, Wendy or Ronnie, why don't you close us out? Well, Thank you for coming, everybody. Wonderful, wonderful to have you. You know, terrific. I love this show. I love what we're able to do for the public. If you cannot fly, if you cannot fly, if you cannot fly, I will lift you up and tell you that I love you. If you cannot fly, if you cannot fly, if you cannot fly, I will lift you up and tell you that I love you. As we travel through this life, there is trouble, there is strife, and someday seem dreary and so long but with courage on our side there's no need to run and hide we can lift our wings and learn to fly if you cannot fly if you cannot fly if you cannot fly i will lift you up and tell you that i love you if you cannot fly, if you cannot fly, if you cannot fly, I will lift you up and tell you that I love you. Now today may not seem bright, cause we cannot see the light, and there's thick black darkness all around. We can soar up to the clouds, and ignore the angry crowds We must lift our wings and learn to fly If you cannot fly If you cannot fly If you cannot fly I will lift you up and tell you that I love you If you cannot fly If you cannot fly if you cannot fly, I will lift you up and tell you that I love you. And if fate will be our friend, there'll be peace around the bend. No more tears for us to cry. If you cannot fly, if you cannot fly, if you cannot fly, I will lift you up and tell you that I love you. If you cannot fly, if you cannot fly, if you cannot fly, I will lift you up and tell you that I love you. I will lift you up and tell you that I